here from, from Cornell. Um, and he will be talking about the um, phase transition between the A and the B phases of bulk superfluidium 3. Um, and without a, uh, an introduction longer than that, I think uh, I will give the stage to you, uh, Jivak. I will just say that if someone wants to ask any questions uh, during the talk, please rise, uh, raise your hand and I will try to uh, pay attention to the, to the list of participants during the presentation. Thanks. So Jivak, go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, coming to this to the seminar. And I must say it's a wonderful series that has been organized, very useful and deeply appreciated in this time. So uh, I'm going to describe some experiments that we carried out at Cornell. Uh, uh, Dima Lotnick was the person who was carrying out the experiments and Dima is here uh, virtually in the meeting. Anna Ayal also uh, set up the experiments to begin with, and Nekshuelev and uh, Abilash basically were responsible for fabricating the nanostructures. Um, so, the so without further ado, let's let's go on with this with. The um, so the history of, of this AB transition is actually quite long and uh, goes back to even the days of John Wheatley, um, who explored the uh, basically the where the polycritical point is located. And uh, if you look on the screen, you'll see a series of gray, uh, diamonds, and those are the experiments that were um, were explored in the early days. The box, as is shown here, basically, if you can see my pointer, that box is the region that I'll be talking about, which is essentially the region of the experiments that we carried out. So the AB transition in A, A phase and B phase are uh, expressed in the bulk. And you can see the, the nominal extent of the A phase is colored in yellow on the, on the diagram. And the B phase occupies much of the phase diagram and that's colored in green. And those are the equilibrium uh, locations uh, of the A and B phases. And um, basically there are other phases which are seen in disordered helium-3 and uh, those are the polar phase and planar phase. And much of the early work in theory was really dedicated to uh, the multiplicity of phases that could exist essentially in the vicinity of the superfluid transition. And that, you know, exploring this territory was one of our motivations in going forward with the experiments. Um, I've also shown a number of early experiments are uh, spread out over the decades prior to 2000. And these are shown in various symbols. Uh, if you like, if you go back to the archive or soon to be published PRL, you'll see what these references are all about. But these experiments were carried out under a diff whole different set of circumstances, many in magnetic fields. Our magnetic field is nominally really small are rather similar to those of the early John Wheatley experiments. So to describe the experimental setup, which is really necessary to appreciate, you know, what we did in this, in this series of investigations. First, we have a, um, a schematic diagram right here. So there are two chambers, one of which has a silver center located in it, and that's designated the heat exchange chamber and the second one is the isolated chamber, much smaller in volume, separated from the heat exchange chamber by a one micron channel, which is 100 microns long and uh, three millimeters wide. So it's really like a letterbox. Or you can see the actual diagram of the cell over here on the left-hand side and the channel then separates the isolated chamber from the heat exchange chamber shown here. And I'll be discussing really mostly the, the transitions that we see in this isolated chamber. 
So our method of detection is, 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 a, is a quartz uh, fork, very similar to what is used many, many places and was in fact, um, uh, you know, functionally the same as say a, a vibrating wire operating in, um, in helium three. And on cooling, one sees um, a abrupt change in the Q at the superfluid transition and then a, a jump in the Q upon uh, transforming from the A phase to the B phase. And on warming, basically you can see the hysteresis between these two, um, between essentially the warming and the cooling transition. And that's shown here quite clearly. Okay, so uh, essentially that data is uh, how we obtain the various data points. And it's generally accepted that the B to A transition uh, happens more or less at the equilibrium transition uh, uh, temperature and pressure. Um, and that's because base, there will be a tiny seed of the A phase that remains in some corner of the cell. And then that aids in the nucleation, the renucleation of the A phase um, uh, when it becomes the equilibrium phase on warming. So to basically describe this, um, this as a puzzle, um, one has to go back to Tony Leggett's work. And uh, Leggett notes, basically noticed or uh, noted, I would say, should say, that there is a very interesting puzzle here. Because when the A phase, particularly at high pressure, uh, when the A phase is present and is expressed, and one can go deep into the into the A phase before the B phase would be the equilibrium value, then you have essentially a competition between two types of free energy. So one there's a surface free energy which increases is the area of the, uh, of the bubble of A phase, let's say, between that and B phase appearing. And um, that essentially goes, increases as the, uh, as the radius of a bubble of B phase that is being created within the A phase um, and R squared. On the other hand, you gain a free energy due to the volume uh, which is increasing as R cubed. And so you wind up with a um, essentially a potential well. Now there are, unlike in, in, the, in classical phase transitions, um, you, have, you have virtually no thermal fluctuations. There are no impurities, there's no dirt involved. And so the transition from the A phase uh, to the B phase is not aided in any way. And so the question that Leggett was uh, basically putting forward on the table is why is it that the B phase is ever nucleated in the system? And um, he proposed a, a possible uh, scenario which involves the deposition of energy by the uh, passage of, um, for example, cosmic ray. Um, and that would locally raise the temperature and then cause um, the, the, the equilibrium B phase to be nucleated uh, upon cooling back. And this was called the baked Alaska mechanism. So by its nature, that's a stochastic process. Um, it's, it's caused by some exterior influence and was tested by Asharoff and his co-workers. And there's some controversy, which I don't want to get into, uh, for various mechanisms to do with the energetics and uh, how exactly this happens. Um, subsequent to that, there was a, very interesting paper put forward um, roughly 10 years ago uh, by Henry Tai. And what Henry proposed is that an entirely different mechanism. 
what he said is that um, you have a multiplicity of phases and conceivably uh, this transition, um, not to argue with whether baked Alaska is valid or not, this is an entirely separate mechanism, um, that in fact there might be the presence of additional phases would allow for resonant tunneling. Um, so essentially a false vacuum uh, to occur because of the presence of this other phase called A prime, uh, which might serve as a reservoir, an intermediate state between this A phase, which is clearly not the equilibrium phase relative to the B phase. And so what he proposed and what stated in the, um, um, in the abstract here is this explanation predicts the existence of peaks in the A to B transition rate for certain values of the temperature, pressure, and magnetic field. So what it says is that um, at particular values of pressure and temperature, magnetic field, there would be a high probability of the conversion because of this re resonant tunneling process. And away from those particular values, basically um, the A phase should be stable against the B phase or metastable against the B phase. So this is a testable um, scenario. Um, and that was one of our motivations also for going forward in this project. So once again, now I'm confined to this little box uh, around the polycritical point right here. Uh, again, this is the stable A phase and this light yellow color is the metastable A phase. Carried out experiments by cooling at constant pressure as shown in with these black lines. And we observed the AB transition to occur very reliably along this blue line so that you can see there are left pointing triangles right here. And um, the black arrows designate uh, three separate uh, transitions where uh, pressures where we essentially pulsed the fork in the IC in the isolated chamber so that we drove the entire volume of helium three inside of that isolated chamber into the normal state and then allowed it to cool as rapidly as possible, allowed by the time constant dictated by the, um, by the channel. And what you see is that um, at 21.4 bar, that's basically this, this track right here, that the AB transition that we see on slow cooling roughly to take a several hours to cool this rather small temperature difference. Uh, that's designated as this dash or this dotted gray line. And then the fast cool transitions are scattered very closely around this, this, this line. Um, at the lowest pressure that was studied here is 21.0 bar. We notice that um, these, these, um, these scattered transitions are much more scattered. Um, and by the way, you also notice that uh, this metastable um, A phase is observed very reliably when you cool uh, below the polycritical point. And um, that's something that is very similar to what is seen in, in uh, aerogel, for example. But below this dashed line right here, um, we do not see uh, the A phase appear on cooling. So looking at the statistics of these transitions, we see that there is a pretty narrow distribution of um, AB transitions around the equilibrium or the slow cool transition, I should say. Slow cool transitions are these dashed vertical lines and we notice that at the lowest pressure, this, this line width is getting um, a bit narrow, uh, sorry, a bit wide, and the transitions are um, becoming kind of ill-defined. 
if we carry out, so this is another view of these, of these pulse transitions. And if we look at two even lower pressures, um, but still above this dashed gray line shown there, we see that the, that the um, breaks, essentially the transitions from A to B are becoming really poorly defined. And you can see that for yourself in these images. So once again, we see a very well-defined uh, AB transition on cooling slowly, and that's these, these lines right here. But when we do fast coolings, we basically, this transition seems to um, be very random. And under those fast cooling uh, conditions, which are roughly 10 times faster than the slow cool transition, um, the transition is no longer reliable. It's not reproduced. Okay, so that's kind of our first indication that uh, something different is happening. And then you notice that there are in, in this region down here, um, we have a, a large number of data points and uh, there's some something quite, I would characterize as funky. Um, so something weird going on. The, you notice, first of all, that we do not continue this blue line all the way back to TC. And that's for a reason. We just basically could not, um, could not take the data um, at an intermediate pressure to, to see this transition happen reliably. Here, I'm basically showing the collection of AB transitions at these exceedingly, at these pressures, um, which, are, which are close to this line. And you can see, in fact, that as the pressure is decreased, so these are all taken at progressively lower and lower pressures, Sometimes there are a couple of data points there are at 20.9, there's two, two sets of transitions that we're showing. And you see that in fact, um, there is not a linear progression, but the lowest two points, which are 20.89 and 20.88 bar, at within basically 10 millibars, of we, we do not see um, a, a um, uh, an AB transition. So it gets extinguished rather rapidly. So here we carried out a slightly different scenario. So in the normal course of, of events, one, not, one carries out uh, transition, uh, investigations at constant pressure. Uh, and in all of these experiments that I'm talking out, we maintained um, a pressure constant by applying a feedback loop controlling the pressure at room temperature. Here in path number one, which is the lowest path shown, you can see that we cooled through the transition at essentially a constant pressure. Once we went through TC, which is well defined, we then continued to cool as well as decrease the pressure. So servo the pressure. And we found that one could cross this divide between the, um, the end of the blue line and the TC line, and then press downward into um, the region that was previously forbidden at, at constant uh, pressure cooling. Um, as we carried out another set of measurements, um, we basically uh, went in at a higher pressure into the equilibrium A phase and then caused the pressure to decrease. Uh, in, this, in this experiment, we were sort of learning our way, uh, so to speak, how to drive. And um, you notice that we crossed through the blue line on several parts, on several locations. And uh, we did not see a A to B transition on crossing this AB line. And that, by the way, was really surprising to us because the assumption is that here we carry out slow cooling, we carry out fast cooling, and we see really good reproducibility 
uh, for this transition from the A phase to the B phase at particular values of pressure and temperature. But here we found that, in fact, that our reproducibility seemed to completely be gone. And then uh, parts three and four are basically additional parts that we followed, um, uh, where, we, where we went in at a somewhat higher pressure and then essentially lowered the pressure uh, to the point where there was an A to B transition C. And you notice that under these four A's, one is extending the pressure uh, where the A phase is observable to even lower pressures and lower temperatures than what was possible uh, under constant pressure cooling um, in, in the experiment. So then we wanted to explore this a little bit further because this seemed like a real puzzle. So we then carried out a series of, um, of investigations where we cooled through the transition, through the transition temperature at um, basically one of two pressures. Um, and we wound up arguing that we should go to a lower pressure if we, if we started at a high pressure and stop at an intermediate pressure and cool or go down to an even lower pressure and then carry out cooling. If we carried out coolings at, um, at this pressure just above the polycritical point, then we had the option to either go up in pressure or go down in pressure and investigate the path dependence um, of the system. So concentrating on these pink data sets, basically going in just above the polycritical point, um, we increased the pressure and we found that the transitions um, that we observed fell short of what we could achieve cooling at constant pressure. Um, similarly, when we carried out blue uh, transitions where we cooled in at a higher pressure and then decreased the pressure, we found that um, invariably we could extend the region that uh, we could observe um, under constant pressure cooling. And then we carried out a series of runs where we started at various pressures of 22 bars. So these are above what we've shown right here. But in all of these runs, we, uh, upon cooling through the transition, we either, we essentially always went past the, um, the AB line and then decreased the pressure and crossed through this blue line at a pressure below 21.5 bar. So I'm not showing the parts here, but what, what transpired is that the region that we could explore uh, was then defined by this broad green line. There's, there's certainly a, a considerable scatter on the scale, few micro Kelvin here. But um, we, we found that basically this green line seemed to define the, um, the region that we could explore um, using decreased pressure um, as, as we cooled through uh, the AB transition. Yeah. So this, room, this essentially is the uh, sum total of our data. Um, where we found that there clearly is a path dependence um, to the occurrence of the AB transition. And um, it seems that the A phase uh, retains some memory of the pressure that TC was crossed at. And that's a very colloquial expression of um, the sum result of everything that we've, that we've here. 
So let me briefly uh, touch on what we saw in the um, in the um, heat exchange chamber, which of course is filled with uh, centered silver, has a lot of silver in it. And uh, there, what we see is so this again is the data. Um, I see is in the blue, and the purple uh, sets of points are what was seen in the HEC. Uh, the the gray diamonds are the original data of Kleinberg and um, uh, Webb and Wheatley, um, and you you notice that there is a great deal of similarity between what they observed and what we found. Uh, so they also could see that the A phase um, uh, could be nucleated or was reliably nucleated below the uh, polycritical point. And uh, however, when you warmed up through the transition, and that's the same as what we see, uh, when you warm up through the transition uh, at pressures below the polycritical point, the A phase does not appear uh, within the precision of these measurements um, on, on warming. And so the phase diagram is in fact uh, reproduced in, 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 you know, under these conditions. Um, the implication is that surfaces are really important and that surfaces are essentially the heterogeneity of the centered silver corresponding to the heterogeneity of the CMN refrigerant, which is basically powdered form in tens of microns of, of boulders of CMN. Um, essentially, they mimic each other rather well. Um, and by the way, we did see a path dependence in the HEC, but it is much less than what was seen in, um, in the IC. And so we did not really um, work to, to, uh, to document that in great detail. Um, the fork that was also operating in the HEC was somewhat less reliable in terms of its operation. So I'd like to kind of summarize where we are in, in, this, in this process. So most importantly, the AB transition really exhibits this unexpected path dependence um, and seems to be correlated to the pressure at which. And um, certainly this is very different from what we would expect in classical uh, systems. Um, it's absolutely true that the pressure and temperature alone cannot uh, adequately parameterize where the phase transitions happen. Um, and basically, the observations that we see are not consistent with the baked Alaska model, but there's no reason why it should be. I, mean, I think the base baked Alaska model is uh, more appropriately applied when there are large free energy differences between the A and the B phase. Um, we certainly observe that the A phase is extremely reliably nucleated when we do experiments at constant pressure um, and down to this roughly a bar or so below, um, below the polycritical point or uh, half a bar or so below the polycritical point. And um, this metastability line, as far as we can tell, is disconnected from the TCP line. So it does not join in in any way. And we can, we can see that the A phase in zero field or nominally zero field is uh, stable quite a bit below the polycritical point when we carry out this depressive pressurization. And so it really raises interesting questions um, because when, when we carry out experiments, for example, in confined geometries, um, then, then 
can we be sure that the phase transitions that we that we see are um, that might might be there? Are, are they going to actually come forward? Um, and it's quite possible that uh, similar effects might uh, preclude, essentially, might might allow for metastability when uh, other phases that might be present uh, should be expressed. And um, it's, it's an interesting conjecture, but uh, the question is whether the presence of the A phase inside of the channel is uh, somehow causing the A phase to persist um, in, 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 the, um, in the IC. And so that's, that's an open question that uh, one can explore in the future. And essentially looping back to um, Henry Tai's um, interest in this problem, it's essentially to do with uh, phase first first sort of phase transitions in the evolution of the universe, and the point is there that uh, he is really looking, or he was looking for a mechanism um, that would allow phase transitions, first order of phase transitions, to occur reliably, because uh, once the system gets too far out of equilibrium then perhaps one would wind up with a situation very similar to Baked Alaska, where uh, it, the, the phase transitions cannot occur because they are stuck, so to speak. And so um, looking for mechanisms that might aid in this process is really quite important. And helium-3 can genuinely be regarded as a model system for exploration. Um, in, in the future. So our future work um, that we will be exploring once we uh, get the cryostat turned around is to really understand whether this path dependence is something which is confined to the region close to the polycritical point. Uh, that's, one, that's one open question. Um, it, would be really interesting to substitute, an, for example, an anisotropic aerogel like nothing in the channel and uh, see if you might be able to see evidence for the polar phase um, in the IC. So essentially, does the, um, does the nucleation, uh, does the presence of the A phase below the polycritical point is that essentially uh, mediated by the uh, type of fluid that is, um, that is, that, that is the parent uh, of the nucleation in this isolated volume. And um, I really put forward the possibility that we should think about quite carefully uh, whether in confined geometries, uh, we have to be simply aware um, that that metastability might well uh, show up quite strongly. I mean, we have explored this, and uh, John Saunders's uh, group has also explored this in Royal Holloway. Um, and generally, it's seen that uh, there is relatively little metastability of uh, the AB transition. In confi under confinement, and that's possibly due to the fact that, of course, the surface to volume ratio is 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 very large. Okay, so with that, I will um, end my presentation and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Jeeva. This is this is very interesting uh, throughout. Um, I believe uh, Bill uh, has a question. Please go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, Jivak, uh, this is a very interesting and, and engaging uh, work that you're reporting on here. I, I have a question about the uh, forks used to determine the phase transition and, and also the measurement of pressure. 
is it possible that the pressure in the near vicinity of either of the two chambers is not on a, let's say a short time scale uh, determined by what you measure at room temperature and therefore playing a role of some kind. And in the same vein, uh, mm -hmm. does the fork itself, is there any dependence on amplitude of the drive of the fork and does that possibly play a role? So, two very good questions, right. So, um, when we change the pressure, so this is sort of the semi-equilibrium pressure that, that we are, that we are um, controlling at home at essentially at, in, a, in a volume nitrogen temperature, um, but connected to the cryostat via a um, capillary. Um, those pressure changes are basically happening. The maximum pressure change that we could, that we did was um, 1.3 bar per day. Um, and that's a, even for this very small channel, um, the pressure differential is really small. Um, it's it's um, much less than a, uh, a millibar um, in, in all of this process. So essentially the flow of atoms going through the channel either positive or negative, uh, basically the pressure differential is on the order of a millibar or less. Um, now, in, in the course of a, uh, say a heating pulse where we overdrive the, the fork, um, clearly at that point, uh, the, the fork is unable to give any meaningful data when it's being overdriven. And there is a recovery time associated with that, um, with that heating process. So roughly, I would say a minute evolves and we drive the fork hard enough so that we wind up in the normal state and actually somewhat could be maybe a couple of tenths of a millikelvin above the transition temperature at the end of the at the end of the pulse and you can see that when we look at data that we acquire there is a perceptible amount of time something in the order of 10 minutes um, where one, uh, where the fork in the IC remains in the normal state. So it has to cool all the way back this, this um, roughly couple of tenths of a millikelvin. And the cooling rate is something on the order of um, 10 times faster than what we that, than what we do under the slow cases. But I'm not sure that that's the question that you're asking. Definitely, if we drive the fork harder, then we will have a temperature gradient between the IC and the HEC. And in fact, there is a, even under the low drive conditions, if we drove the fork even at an even smaller amplitude, we'd still wind up with a finite temperature uh, difference. And that's because there appears to be a intrinsic heat leak into the IC that we cannot control. So we have to correct for um, the offset in temperature, which is a few microkelvin. Um, but that we assume is constant, and that's from our characterization, thermal characterizations is pretty much constant in this pressure range. So I hope that's somewhat long rambling answer contains what you're looking for. Thanks, Jeeva. Uh, while we wait for other people to come up with questions, I might ask a few things. So um, first of all, uh, in bulk A-phase measurements in a large container, 
Um, when you have a mechanical thermometer, something moving, which which uh, reacts to to collisions with quasi particles in the A phase. Um, in Lancaster measurements, there have been various like um, weird um, time dependencies in otherwise stable conditions. So is the is is the is your container for the wave phase so small that this kind of texture or whatever effects don't exist, or have you ever seen them? I can't say that we've actually seen you know significant textural effects. I mean. The, the, um, uh, essentially near TC, I think uh, the AB transition, you know, or, or the A phase and B phase are both very reproducible to the extent that we can measure. I mean, I must say our, our forks were being driven at um, relatively uh, small amplitudes and uh, we had some degree of, um, uh, how should I say it, crosstalk between drive and detect. Um, so signal to noise was an issue in this experiment, but not to the extent that um, so that kind of mitigates if there are textural things, I, I, there's some precision with which we could uh, give you a definitive answer near TC. But I, to that extent, we could not see anything different, any textural things. We did sit at a, um, a temperature within a few micro Kelvin, uh, less than five off where we see the AB transition happen at constant pressure. So maintaining the pressure constant, sitting close to the AB transition uh, for a day. And um, there was no, essentially, you know, you have, you have just a blob of noise at that point. There's no AB transition, there's no textural change there. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Um, well then, well, this is a related question. I think you probably already answered this to some extent during the presentation, but but um, how about the reproducibility of uh, these like, like creative traces? Are, um, are they always the same or, or, um, or is, is there something you cannot control there? So if we go back the green line data. Um, I think what I'm trying to emphasize here, so this is kind of going back. So this green line, kind of notional green line that we have really seems to represent the, the, the maximal extent of uh, where we can see AB transitions um, in this pressure range, providing we cool and we cross the blue line below 21.5 bar. Um, I'm pretty confident that if we carried out runs at higher pressure and then dropped down, we could extend this region of, of metastability to the left. Um, but as far as carrying out measurements at constant pressure, um, uh, if we did reproducibility of slow cool transitions, that is to say trajectories just going and taking a day to, to cool down to here, we would see a distribution of, um, of AB transitions that's likely very narrow. I mean, we. We did a few of these. It takes, by its nature, it takes a day per transition. Um, and, but I don't think we did more than two or three, maximum three at any given pressure. So I would refer you though to uh, Perthi Hockenen's um, uh, comment to Leggett's PRL, where they 
where they viewed um, AB transition many times uh, uh, and they got quite narrow uh, transitions uh, done in a magnetic field, of course, but um, and, and that was uh, the line that he observed or that they observed in Helsinki was um, denoted the catastrophe line um, in those experiments. So I think there's really good evidence that constant pressure cooling gives you a high degree of reproducibility with quite narrow transitions um, in this region. Smeev has a question. Yes, Dima, please. What? Uh, hi, Jivak. Thanks for your talk. So I saw that you've made an experiment in a couple of magnetic fields. Is that right? Different. That's correct. We did do experiments in magnetic fields, and the fields were, I think, 25 and 50 Gauss. Um, I would say there. In all cases, we we definitely see you know we see a shift in the AB uh, in what we see at, at under under um, nominal zero field transitions. Um, it did not look like this this path dependence was um, went away. Let's put it that way in those magnetic fields. We tried the field uh, to be applied parallel to the channel and perpendicular to the channel. Um, uh, parallel to the channel would of course reinforce the texture, uh, the uniform texture that you'd expect in the, in the channel. And um, parallel, uh, applying a field uh, perpendicular to the channel would certainly change the spin um, orientation, um, but presumably the L would still be locked, but who knows if it's, if it's uniform or not. Um, there was no obvious difference between when we looked parallel and perpendicular, but you've got to realize that I think those experiments are getting really Baroque and I wasn't, I wasn't super happy um, uh, taking so much data. It would take it would take us, you know, to accumulate decent data would take us a, a much longer time than I would care to expend on this. Yeah, so we didn't really push that very hard. But do you have a question associated with that? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering. Uh... And how the magnetic field would um, change all this uh, point. division I, dynamics and yeah. and also yeah well you can do obviously you can do these uh, paths with magnetic field as well so varying magnetic field while in the superfluid which is yeah. of a lot of work yeah and very difficult to yeah yeah, yeah. it's yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, I, I agree, it's a lot of work. I mean, I think I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in what happens, you know, away from this very limited region near, near, um, near the polycritical point. Yeah. All right. Um... I think Igor has a question. So, thank you, Jovak, for beautiful presentation. Can I ask a, a, a simple question? So, you have observed uh, a phase at pressure below the triple point. Is it correct? Yes. That's very difficult. To understand because I can explain I can understand that you don't have uh, you don't observe the phase which is uh, energetically favorable the, like uh, the effects and so on but how can you observe the phase which is not energetically the, the ground state at the condition thank you 
It's it's a very good question, but I mean, Igor, you have to also remember uh, the experience, collective experience in aerogel, right? Yeah. So in aerogel, mm -hmm. in uniform aerogel, we know, we expect that the B phase is the equilibrium phase. Um, and in for helium-3 in aerogel, basically in every single experiment, when you cool down, the A phase is seen uh, to be metastable over a huge pressure and temperature range. And of course, there you can excuse this, um, this observation of the A phase um, by saying that, okay, there's some pocket and there's, you know, some high density of aerogel and so on. And so there you, you see the A phase appearing and it, um, it, it occurs so reliably and then, then it spreads around and, and then you get the A phase um, living, so to speak, across um, a big region of temperature and pressure. Um, but here we have, we have a relatively tiny region of where the A phase is seen to be metastable below the polycritical point when we cool at constant pressure. And conceivably there has to be, I mean, you know, we didn't have any huge uh, shielding. We didn't do any explicit shielding. So there's almost certainly the Earth's field has to be there. And so the A phase may exist in some tiny region near, near TC and then this persists um, and so that might, that might cause it to be metastable um, uh, on cooling. Further, I would argue that um, really the question is when you have normal state present in the IC and the channel, which is at a colder temperature, it is essentially more closely tied to the heat exchange chamber that one is in the A phase, then when you nucleate um, the superfluid in the, in the IC, um, if you were to form the B phase in the IC, then that would automatically mean that there's an interfacial energy cost between the A and the B phase. And so perhaps the A phase nucleates um, just to obviate or remove that, um, that, that uh, interfacial cost. And so perhaps that's why we get the A phase appearing so reliably um, in a metastable region below the polycritical point. But this is all speculation. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's the observation is correct. Yeah, I'm happy with Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, I think Volodya Dmitriev has, has a question, please. Uh, hello, Jiva. Hey. Uh, as, as I understand, uh, you perform experiments using pure helium-3. Yes. yes. But uh, have you plans to add helium-4 in order to change boundary condition? Maybe your phase diagram will be changed? I'm, I'm almost, it's, thank you for that. That's a very, that's, that's, that's actually very true because I mean, if we have, if we have this strong um, uh, surface dependence, um, then certainly the implication would be that if we were to change the boundary condition, then there will, there must be a, um, there must be a, uh, consequence on, on the AB transition. We have not done this. Um, and the reason is, I guess, largely the reluctance to pollute our helium-3 sample, which we cannot then recover, right? So that's kind of my, my fear and um, concern about doing these, doing, adding helium-4. Um, but I'm, reasonably sure that your that the question that you ask uh, asking there will be a dependence yes but yeah. 
Well, maybe it will be interesting. It will definitely be interesting, but I'm I'm highly reluctant to do this. Yeah. Yes, just, but just... It's easy to clean to clean helium four from helium three just by charcoal. Okay, it's yeah, now. That's, that's yeah, thank um, you, thank you. yeah. Anyway, okay. For the future, right. All right, thank you. Uh, I think Bill has a question. Ajiva, how long is the channel? It's a hundred microns long, at least the, the 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 confined channel. There are lead-in bits, uh, which are two and a half millimeters long, and they are two hundred microns tall, with the same width of three three millimeters. Um, so. I think those those parts, um, the lead-in channels are on the side. They they would be essentially bulk-like, yeah. Um, except that they would give you a uniform um, in the aphase. If there's aphase present, then it would give you a uniform texture. So, do I understand Most correctly? Likely. If you understand correctly, you have helium three in all three areas in the, in the two. Yes, everywhere is filled with essentially pure helium three or 20, 10, 10, 20 ppm helium three. Yeah, no, but you have helium three in both of the experimental chambers, one of them being the heat exchanger and the, and also thirdly, in the channels, and and the TC is not suppressed in the channel. TC is not suppressed to any degree in the channel. Um, at, so at, that, an, at one micron height. So you always have an interface you would, between the A phase and whatever superfluid phase might be in either one of those chambers. That is correct. Yes. That's correct. I mean, if there's if there's a phase on either side, then there's no interface, and otherwise there will be an interface. And so the channel, when the HEC is in the B phase, that B phase does not propagate into the um, into the um, IC at all. And there is, I mean, I haven't shown you the entire diagram that we've explored. We have carried out measurements at constant pressure to somewhat higher pressures, actually going up to 29 bar. And there is a very interesting region of the phase diagram where one sees a um, the two lines, the two phase transition lines for A and B phase in the HEC and the IC actually come together. So we take that to be uh, indicative of the uh, AB transition happening in the channel. But that happens at like 25 bar or somewhere in that region. Yeah. So they come together around 25 bar in a very interesting way. And then at even higher pressures, the AB transitions in both occur simultaneously in time. So Jivak, as you know, when you warm up, course, you see, uh, then uh, the coherence length uh, gets uh, substantially longer. So the 100 microns may not be uh, a reasonably small number of coherence length of the region that you approach TC, but if a somewhat smaller length, then you might indeed be in that Josephson couple limit. Wouldn't you have to be really close to TC for that to happen? Uh, it's the, the measure, the, the length scale is the coherence length. So you're right, it's about a factor of 100 or so for 100 microns. So I was just asking about the possibility of doing some devices, uh, which uh, might hmm. couple two different superfluid phases. I think that's that's an interesting possibility. I mean, certainly one could one could make really much smaller um, structures um, in in all dimensions. 
and um, really get into, uh, you know, more deliberately kind of engineered um, um, couplings and injunction physics. And I think this, this kind of junction physics is something that uh, John Saunders is also really interested in exploring. But it's, a, it's an interesting, and it doesn't have to be done with size. I mean, in principle, one can do this even with um, engineered aerogel, right? Mm -hmm. So all kinds of, I mean, I think it's a very powerful system to explore. But we, it seems like we really don't, I mean, this, I have to really emphasize that the path dependence is quite mysterious. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Let's put it that way. All right. At, at this stage, I will interrupt the discussion for a brief moment and say that the next uh, webinar will be likely in two weeks, but this remains to be confirmed. So we will post it on the website and send emails about that later on. Um, do we have any any further questions that people would like to ask? But well, I'm not seeing any any further questions, so maybe we can wrap this up here. Um, thank you, Jiva, for a, a very interesting presentation, and I'd also like to thank the entire audience for participating in the or at least those who participated in uh, in the discussion for a um, insightful discussion. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, also join us the the next time in, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Oh. Thanks, Jivak. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jivak. Thank you. Yes, right. Good, Jivak. Thank you very much. I suppose Thanks, you, you have to end your meeting because you are now the host. Well, I have to do it. Okay, I so can do I it will. as well. How do I end? Oh, you can do it. Yeah, I can do it.